Welcome to the Entrepreneurs Network. I'm Rick Anthony. My guest today is different from most of the entrepreneurs we invite to the Entrepreneurs Network. He spent most of his career in the nonprofit world, high level positions in organizations such as the University of Pennsylvania Health System, Mercy Catholic Health System, and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, interspersed with a few stints with for profit early stage ventures. One thing has been constant. Wherever he's been, whatever he's done, whatever position he's held, he has been motivated by a desire to serve people by making their lives better. Today, as CEO of Inglis House, Gavin Kerr leads an organization that's dedicated to assisting people with disabilities and those who care for them to live meaningful, purposeful lives to their fullest. Welcome, Gavin, to the Entrepreneur. Thanks, Rick. Delighted to have you. I guess we've known one another for a few years, yeah, and yeah. I, I guess I, I first met you when you were at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doing compensation work at that time. You, yeah, comp yeah, and then uh, that was just the beginning, as I recall. <laughs> you moved up rapidly. I, I didn't realize until I started doing some research that Inglis House is much more than that complex of buildings uh, down at 2600 Belmont Avenue, right on the edge of the city, I guess, the boundary line. Much more than that. Tell us about it. So Inglis serves about a thousand people um, throughout the Philadelphia region. Um, Inglis House, which is what most people are aware of, yes. is um, serves 297 people with significant physical disabilities and complex complex healthcare needs. Um, the folks that we serve are almost all quadriplegics. Mm -hmm. All use power chairs. Mm -hmm. um, over half of them have multiple sclerosis and. Um, the, the vast majority of the people we serve have neurological degenerative diseases, um, both at Inglis and the community. Mm -hmm. In the community, we have currently 251 accessible, affordable apartments um, throughout the region from South Jersey to Berks County. Yes. And um, the need for housing for people with disabilities is huge. We have about a six-year wait list for our apartments. Six year? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Do you own the apartments or at least? We do. We really? own the apartments. We develop them. Mm -hmm. um, there are several government programs that mm -hmm. allow us to, to capture the capital we need to build them. It's designed to be a break-even business. So, mm -hmm. um, Do you care only for adults or adults and children as well? We only serve people at 18 and older. So mm -hmm. the average age of the people we serve is about 47. Um, mm -hmm. Our youngest person we serve who is in our, our day program um, is 18, and the oldest person we serve who is also in our day program is 102. No kidding. Um, we also have an employment program and an adaptive computing program and a supports coordination care management program. So it's a very broad, vertically integrated service. When did English break out of the, co the confines of that complex? It's been about 30 years um, since we brought in to serve the yes. com community. Um, the first 100 years really was built around institutional care, which was the norm at mm -hmm. that point in time. Yes. And um, as we moved into the 70s and 80s, we recognized that there are many, many more people who need to be served who don't want to live in a long-term care facility or right. don't need to live in a long-term care facility. It's 140 years old, mm -hmm. or thereabouts. Almost. Is it the oldest in the country? I think so. Um, it's hard to know because there's, it's not a, it's a, a industry that's not consolidated. Mm -hmm. um, and there are only very few of us. So. There are only seven other organizations like Inglis House that provide long-term care services for Is people with right? physical disabilities. And then there's a huge amount of fragmentation yes. around the community-based services and the housing components of what mm -hmm. we do. So um, I, don't, I, I, I think we're probably the largest. I know we're the only vertically integrated service provider so that hmm. no matter who you are and where you want to live, mm -hmm. we have a solution that you can tap into to help you live a great life. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it faith-based or is it uh, no, ec ecumenical? We are, we are ecumenical. Um, it takes a lot of faith to do what people do that yes. live and work with us. I'll say. Um, but we were started by a little girl in the 1870s. Um, Annie Inglis was um, 14 when she developed scarlet fever. And at that point in time, scarlet fever, fever was a life-changing and deadly disease. Yes. And so she was cared for at Pennsylvania Hospital back when they had the huge wards of 16 mm -hmm. kids in each ward. And she saw that there were families that would leave their child there because they just couldn't care for them. And so she went home and she and her mom, talking with her mom, said, Mom, we really should start a place for kids like me whose families can't take care of them. And that was really the beginning of Inglis. Was it a family of means? They were just an upper middle class family. I mean, they no. weren't wealthy, but they, no. they were also comfortable. 
But she came up with an ingenious way to fund it, as I recall. Yes, she did. So Annie died when she was 18, oh. and her mom took a gold coin and went to all of her friends and sold them the gold coin. And then they gave the gold coin back with their donation. Mm -hmm. And having done that on multiple, multiple cycles, she raised the money to start the first Inglis. And so it was in her home, and they brought people into the home and cared for them just as if they were her, their daughter. Mm -hmm. Inglis then grew to a point in the latter part of the 1880s where they had a home in West Philadelphia that served about 40 people. And um, it was really just very much family care because there was no health care at that point. There was mm -hmm. very little. It was home, called the Philadelphia Home for Incurables. Mm -hmm. And um, they were next to the train lines in West Philadelphia. And when the steam trains went by, they pushed sparks out and they had a shingle roof and the, the oh place my. kept going on fire, which if you're in a wheelchair is terrifying. Yes. So when they built the Kern Inglis house in 1927, when you drive by it, you see it's all stone and slate roofs. And they did that so it could never, ever catch fire. Interesting. Gavin, yeah, you've been a for-profit entrepreneur uh, with a technology company, and I think mm -hmm. you had a bank, a yep. startup bank. In your current role as CEO of a, a nonprofit, uh, do you see parallels between your for-profit life and your not-for-profit life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, to some degree, the, f the only real difference yes. is how the profits get used. I mean, it's... Our mission is clearly different than most for-profits, right. um, but when it comes down to solving complex problems, mobilizing and yes. leading people, you know, using technology to create disruptive change, all of those lessons are fully applicable to the not-for-profit world, mm -hmm. and in some ways even more so, because the other major difference between a not-for-profit and a for-profit is that the measures of success are much more complex. So in the for-profit world, generally, you know you're doing well if you're driving a bottom line and your shareholders are happy. Mm -hmm. In the not-for-profit world, you still have to drive a bottom line, but you also have to meet a variety of quality and quality of care, quality of life, mm -hmm. and other metrics. And balancing return on mission and return on investment is a very mm -hmm. big challenge, particularly when you're funded by Medicaid. Medicaid, yeah. Uh, uh, that. That was another question. Uh, how, from where does your revenue come? And do the people you care for have to pay for the care themselves? Suppose they're not eligible. Uh, do, so, do you provide free care? All of our care is free. All of our um, care is free. So in America, sadly, when you become significantly disabled, if you're a middle, a middle class, right. within five years you're impoverished. And, you know, it's the cost of health care, the mm -hmm. cost of modifying your home, mm -hmm. getting a van, all of the things that take up all your capital. Mm -hmm. And so almost everybody, unless they really are wealthy, wind up impoverished on Medicaid with disability benefits, which are $11,000 a yes. year. And so 96% of our revenue comes through Medicaid. And as you know, you know Medicaid is under enormous yes. stress, yes. Uh, both because of the ever-growing needs and demands and the, the state and federal budget challenges that they face. And so we've seen our revenue cut by almost 18.5% over the course of the last How do you make up for the years. shortfall? We fundraise a lot, and fundraising is essential to what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're fortunate that the families and people who came before us have mm -hmm. built an endowment, so the mm -hmm. endowment helps cover the losses. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, but you would never get into this business as a for-profit yeah. because there's no economic model that is genuinely profitable. You mentioned an employment program. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is, does that mean you place some of your folks in employment situations off-site? Um, yeah, we do some placement, but the primary part is we have 72 employees who work for us on a contract basis okay. with other organizations. So um, an example is if you're in Philadelphia and you get a photo for your license, Yes. Um, many of the photo license center folks who are doing that are actually our employees on contract to the state. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a number of contracts. We'd love to have more. So if there's mm -hmm. anybody watching that has work, we would love to serve them. Mm -hmm. The people we serve are really cognitively well and smart, capable people just like you and me, but mm -hmm. either because of bad luck or mm -hmm. bad genes um, wind up being disabled. Does English provide them with the equipment they need, the chairs, the, the other apparatus for breathing and so on? We assist them in that. So the, those are all funded through Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And so 
our staff works with them to identify what's the right equipment that they need. We yeah. do seating clinics or whatever the, is needed, and then we assist them in, in getting access to those. Because some of that equipment, is, they're, they're technological wonders. Oh, it's incredible. What, what it's able to do these days. Yeah, it's, the power chairs are yes. miraculous. They're also incredibly expensive. They yes. can cost twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. One of the things we do with technology that's really blossoming that I'm very excited about is really helping people access the the internet. Mm -hmm. If you can move your eyeballs, mm -hmm. we can get you on the internet. And mm -hmm. then once you're on the internet, you can communicate it, with friends and family. Whole whole you can sure. work. Yeah. We have a gentleman who has. Um, lived in English for about 30 years. He was an uh, Eastern Airlines management trainee, which you and I remember, but a lot oh, of younger yes, people don't. Yeah. And he got up in the middle of the night and went to the bathroom and turned the wrong way and went down three steps and severed his spinal cord in Ooh. the neck. So he's paralyzed from the shoulders down. Um, Elliot is the webmaster for three different companies. Is um, that right? Including Inglis. And he does web design and he has a, a business. He actually got an award um, a, a couple of years ago and sent it out to his customers as sort of a marketing yes. thing. And they were shocked because they had no idea that he was disabled. They just thought yes. he was a web designer like anybody else. And he has no use of his arms or hands. He does it all? All with eyes, voice, and sip and puff. Yeah. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, I know, uh, I, I've mentioned this chap to you before, Steve McWilliams, he's a, he teaches at Villanova. He teaches script writing and um, uh, screenwriting, rather, and, and film production. Anyway. He works with people with disabilities, students, and he had one who was a paraplegic who wrote an entire screenplay with a pencil mm -hmm. in his mouth, just pecking away. Yep. An entire screenplay. Yeah. We have... He's, he's uh, genius. Yeah, it's incredible. There's, well, they're just talented people who yeah. had bad genes or bad luck. Yeah. You know, it's, but what's really interesting God does about that is... I mean, the, he yeah, does. Yeah. And the, the other part is the amount of determination it takes to do what he yes. does. You know, doing a screenplay mm -hmm. using a mouth stick is probably ten times longer than typing, if not yes. more. Yes. One of the things we do, all of the people in our management roles have to spend two days a year in a wheelchair doing what people with disabilities do so to build empathize. that connection. And one of the things we have people <coughs> do is use a, a mouth stick and mm -hmm. a glasses that are blurred mm -hmm. so that they can see what it's like to use the computer. Yes. And, you know, each of us has to write an email. It took me 35 minutes to write a one-sentence email. Uh, you know, obviously I'm not very good at it, but still, it's just mm -hmm. as the determination that the folks we serve have is incredible. Uh, so you are a social entrepreneur, uh, with a, a, at least a double, maybe a triple bottom line, <laughs> uh, from your, the banking yep. days. Um, tell me the story about Drink Aid and how it originated, because it is a story of innovation and entrepreneurship, yep. solving a need, and whether or not it generates revenue for you, or for Inglis. Yep. So DrinkAid is a device that has a bottle and a very special long hose on it so uh -huh. that people can drink when they can't move their arms. And why that's important is that if you become dehydrated, you're more likely to get uh, wound, skin wounds, mm -hmm. urinary tract infections, mm -hmm. and it will exasperate MS and other things if you're dehydrated. So uh, we had a, a physical therapist and a resident who were trying to figure out how to solve that problem. And so together they worked on designing this and went through multiple iterations and ultimately came out with a product that works really well. And it has a huge impact on people's quality of life. It, it's a break-even business. Um, mm. We sell several thousand a year. It's a on the internet. On the internet, um, it's a consumer-driven business, right. and so people who we serve are actually the folks who do manufacturing, marketing, the whole spectrum of services. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a real it's a entrepreneurial story. success story. Uh, uh, how long has it been around? For about eighteen years. That long. Yeah. We sell them in Australia and Brazil, uh -huh. and, as well as you know a lot in the, the area. You can't possibly have saturated the market. The market must be very large. Um, it's not huge, but we uh -huh. haven't saturated it yet by any stretch. Mm -hmm. I was in Florida a year ago, and I went to dinner, and there was somebody there who was mm -hmm. um, using one. And I asked her about it, and she said, "Oh, I just found this. It changed my life." Could the design be adapted so it has other uses by other people? We've tried. We've um, you know, we've one of the things we thought about is the triathlete market, where yes. they're always pushing. They don't want to take exactly. their hands off, um, and it worked. It works for that, but it's mm -hmm. too clunky. You know, they mm -hmm. want aerodynamics. 
Um, but we keep looking. We have another venture that we're working on now. We, we bought a 3D printer. Yes. And um, that technology is just incredible. Oh, yeah. And so we have a group of folks who are working on making custom joystick handles for their, their chairs. Yes. Because if you have limited mobility, controlling the joystick becomes incredibly important. Yes. And so we did a partnership with the Drexel um, uh, Bioengineering Group to, yeah. to develop that. And it's not where it needs to be, but we've, we're on a good start. H have you been down to Drexel's Innovation Center? Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Do you work with them on we do. different it's, projects? It's a, that's part of the partnership. We've yeah. actually had a, our first group of students who started as freshman design majors mm -hmm. who are just graduating, and they've worked on this project all along. And the evolution in their lifetime of their four years yes. of work has been unbelievable in terms of 3D printing and what it's made available. Gavin, I would think that robotics would be very important, increasingly important mm -hmm. in your world. Yeah, the, the dilemma with robotics is that the cost point is just still mm. way beyond our reach. Yeah. And because each person is very different and needs, our world's all about customized care. And yes. so robotics works best when you have a repetitive activity. Mm -hmm. But there's some really cool technology that's developing to be an assistant. So when someone's living independently and they have a tenant who comes and cares for them, mm -hmm. Many of those things are starting to be robotized. Mm -hmm. um, the place where it's really breaking through right now, in addition to the adapt adaptive computing, is environmental controls. Mm -hmm. So being able to um, control the heat, control mm -hmm. the um, TV, control the door openers, all things you can't do yes. on your own is just a huge benefit. So we're partnering with Comcast, and we've worked with them to set up a lab at Inglis House that will... Um, allow us to be their test site for all of their X1 um, adaptation, adaptive technologies. Mm -hmm. So media, home control, security, all of those things. So we're very excited about that. And that would, the, is that what, voice activated? Voice activated primarily, yep. yes. And the, 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 in addition to being very cool and helping people's lives, as a cost savings vehicle, it's huge because if we can reduce the amount of paid attendant care that yes. people need at home, yes. that has a huge cost benefit. So typically, um, a person who's a quadriplegic will need 10 hours a day of care. And the folks are low paid, but if you add in the overhead, it's about 19 to $20 per hour. Mm -hmm. So if you can reduce two hours a day sure. times 365 days, that starts to be really meaningful money. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if you can reduce the number of people who are having to be transported to go to doctor's office by using telehealth, right. um, that's about $250 each direction of transportation expense that you can reduce. What's the possible application of, for example, Apple's the smart watch, Apple's watch? What's the possible application of that? We're just beginning to understand that. We have a number of people who are using Fitbits because a, a big challenge when you're a quadriplegic is you don't get exercise. Yes. So finding ways to create opportunities for people to mm -hmm. have motion, mm -hmm. to track their, their calorie burn, and then mapping that against their diet mm -hmm. to help them find the balance. Because it's, it's um, as you know, anytime you become a beast, your health gets complicated. Yes, yeah. Uh, atrophy. Yeah. Uh, and gravity. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question and it completely escaped. Oh. What is the incidence among paraplegics of their regaining some functionality that the expert said was, would never happen? I know of a couple of instances where, and I know they, they were paraplegics they, from the neck down, but through determination and a great deal of care, obviously, they've come back. They've got some functionality. I don't know the, I, I really don't know that statistic. I know that it happens. Do you see much of it at English? We don't because the people we serve really are post rehab and now living. Yes. So if you think of the healthcare system, the acute care hospital cares for you for four years. Mm. The rehab hospital and home care is 16 to 30 days. Mm -hmm. And then we're people, the rest of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And um, because a large group of the people we serve have neurodegenerative diseases like MS and ALS and other things, we work with them to try to minimize the, the speed of the decline mm -hmm. and to maximize the quality of their lives while they're doing that and their mm -hmm. activities. So uh, that's, that's really an area that you know, Moss Rehab yes. and McGee and some yes. of the great places in the area can give you a better idea of. We get folks at the point where they really are now committed to living with their disability. If you've got a six-year, I think you said six-year wait, mm -hmm. waiting list, 
what, what do those people do who aren't able to have access to the kind of high level care you provide? So home, home care? Are there, or so, are there other facilities? Well, the six year wait is for our apartments. Oh, so okay. many you, of you them are so. living in inaccessible homes, mm -hmm. very isolated, and getting you know community based services. Yeah. But it's not much of a life. You know, think of yourself if you are a 42 year old man who develops MS, who used to have a job and be independent and an yes. income, and suddenly you have to adapt. And you happen to live in South Philly in a row house, which has, has stairs getting in and stairs right. getting up. Yep. Um, you become incredibly isolated, and that drives depression and you know a high incidence of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So. Moving into your own apartment is just a really freeing thing for many people. And mm -hmm. um, our apartments are designed what we call accessibility plus, so that if yes. you're in a power chair, it's as independent a living as you can possibly find. You know, the other services we provide, we have a small waiting list for Inglis House. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are living in nursing homes where they're with the elderly. Yes. Um, and, you know, which isn't a bad thing for in terms mm -hmm. of care, but mm -hmm. you know, if you're that same 42-year-old man mm -hmm. and you have an 83-year-old roommate, it just isn't much of a life. And so we try to give people lives. Um, as a CEO of a nonprofit that serves a growing community, what's the biggest challenge you have? Is, is it revenue? Is it income? Yeah. yeah our, our biggest challenge is, is really revenue and cost control. Mm -hmm. And so on the revenue side, we have one customer. It's essentially, it's Medicaid, and they're a monopsonist, so they get to choose mm -hmm. what the, the price is. And given the stress, they're con continually reducing yes. it. On the cost side, you know, nothing ever stays cheap. Um, labor is about 70% of our expense, so as benefit mm -hmm. expense and salary increases happen, mm -hmm. that drives most of the cost. But there are also these other costs that are out of control, so pharmaceutical expense. Mm -hmm. The new drugs are amazing. The MS drugs, yes. you know, there's a variety of things that are miraculous. But at $3,000 a dose, it's just you know, a huge expense that we don't get reimbursed at the full cost for. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a moral issue here, because the, the miracle drugs that are extending life but not improving the quality of life mm -hmm. in many instances. That's, that's, that's a slippery slope. A, yeah. Fortunately for the people we serve, the miracle drugs oftentimes really do improve, improve quality. or at least stabilize mm -hmm. them for a period of time. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're that same 42-year-old and you have progressive MS and it's going to get worse and worse and worse, yes. if we can sustain you as you are for an extra 18 months, that's a huge mm -hmm. benefit to quality of life. Yes. Um, and but there is a, gift, a question gift around... to the family as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And there's a huge question around, you know, who should pay for that, right? Yes. As taxpayers pay for yeah. it, as we get more stressed, it's a, it's a huge social problem. And, and that issue is going to be on the table more and more. More and more, yeah. As we... Well, which in, in the senior... Among the boomers, as you know, in senior living, the trend is towards aging in place mm -hmm. rather than going off and being warehoused in an institution of some right. kind. And I mean that quite literally, being warehoused all too often. Is, is there a similar trend in your area where, because of technology, because of the availability mm -hmm. of people who are willing and able uh, to try to improve quality of life in their own homes, not an apartment necessarily, absolutely. one of yours, but in their own homes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's more cost a, effective in the It's long more way. cost effective. It's also. There was a recent Supreme, or not recent, 1999 Supreme Court case in which people with intellectual disabilities sued the, the state for more independence. And the Supreme Court said people need to have the option to live in the least restrictive environment possible. Mm -hmm. And so that's really driving policy change, which I think is good change, to try to create the opportunities for people to live as independently as possible. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually developing a new model of care that creates almost the equivalent of Inglis House in the community, so that you can mm -hmm. live in your own place, but you can get integrated, coordinated care. Right. You can get attendant care that works and then have the opportunity to be engaged both physically and virtually through our programs. It's somewhat analogous to uh, Beacon Hill in Boston, one of the first mm -hmm. aging in place. Very much so. Um, and the work that's being done by the, uh, what's it called? There's a center at, at uh, Temple University. 
headed up by Nancy, I forgot her last name, but she's been one of the early advocates for aging in place, mm -hmm. not, not only changing legislation, but again, pushing the, techno the technology right. and attitudinally accepting the idea you don't have to go off and be put right. someplace. You, um, you, you should continue to be a, a, a part of a vibrant community. One of the hard things for people who've uh, been working in this field for a long time <clears throat> is it used to be that we thought we had a responsibility to protect people yes and it was very paternalistic I think we've all learned that there's a dignity in being able to take a risk and so mm -hmm. if somebody wants to live independently and mm -hmm. even as a professional the caregiver thinks that's a risk we need to do everything we can to enable them to take that risk mm -hmm. and that's a very fundamental shift in the way people think about living with disabilities. Mm -hmm. A great one, I mean, I think it's the right thing to do, but we have ethical challenges all the time. It's part of your mission, your vision, and maybe your personal goal. Uh, do you see Inglis as setting the pace, being a trendsetter, breakthroughs in, in care mm -hmm. and the application of technology? Absolutely, that's our goal. That is your goal. Yeah, because we, we know that there's, there's three, three things that we know. One is that financially the current models are no longer sustainable. Right. And so we really have to innovate to find new ways to deliver better care cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, second, we know that with technology, just as in an entrepreneurial setting, there's the ability to do disruptive things that mm -hmm. will allow better lives at less cost. Mm -hmm. And then the third <clears throat> is um, almost the same as you do in the Internet, Disintermediating is a huge opportunity mm -hmm. because most of the people who are served by the social services system are served by multiple providers. Yes. And so there's an enormous inefficiency in yes. that. Yes, yes, yes. And so all the stuff I learned from doing an internet company yeah. absolutely apply to what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. And the urgency is even greater because the need grows and the resources are smaller. Mm -hmm. I, I know, Gavin, from our previous conversations over the years, that you are a man of faith and you believe that God offers you certain choices, invites you to at least consider certain choices, but leaves it to you mm -hmm. to make the choice and follow your own path. Is that a fair way to describe your philosophy? Absolutely. I mean, I think we're all called to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And each of us has different skills and abilities, and part of life is figuring out how to unfold those for the most good. Mm -hmm. Do you have a message for other successful for-profit executives as they reach a point in their lives where they begin to wonder, is that, is that all there is? Isn't there something more I could be doing? And they reach the legacy part of their lives, and it happens to most of us, I think. Do you have a message for them as to how they might redirect, re-channel their energies, their talents, and so on, to be of help to other yeah. people? Uh, absolutely. I think this is the perfect time for people to become social entrepreneurs and to find ways to serve others that will give meaning and purpose to your life. Mm -hmm. um, having worked half my career in the for-profit world, it's great work. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do reach a point where you start to question, you know, is this really what I'm called to do in my life? And with the, the opportunities to innovate um, and to do good in the world, and yeah. certainly the enormous needs, um, there couldn't be a better time. Yeah. And as a culture and as a society, we're really, really valuing and rewarding social innovation. Mm -hmm. So think about Kickstarter. Yeah. That didn't exist 20 years ago. You could never have right. done the kinds of social innovations that yes. are happening. Um, there's a new model called social impact bonds, which is a third way for not-for-profits to raise money, mm -hmm. and it has huge opportunities for people. Mm -hmm. um, and with the technology, you know, there's all these smart people in the world who could really make a difference. You see the push coming from the millennials? Absolutely. Yeah. Although it's interesting, according to the research, as, as, as boomers grow older and millennials grow older, there is more connectivity between the two cohorts. Mm -hmm. they, they share essentially the same values. It's really curious. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah, you do accept contributions, don't you? Absolutely. And there is a website. There is, www.inglis.org, and there's a very easy donation uh, activity. And we love to engage with people. So in addition to donating, you know, come visit us. It's a, a, a really fascinating place to visit, and we love to have people volunteer and just be a part of our community. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you so much. Rick, thank you. And thank you for all you do for so many people. Um, I suggest that you do check out the, web, the website, rather. There are some things about English that you probably never knew before. I always thought it was simply this, this 
collection of formidable looking buildings down there. <laughs> Uh, but it's much more than that, as you've heard. Until next time, this is the Entrepreneurs Network. I am Rick Anthony. Take very good care of yourselves.